a massive influence on Western culture, and particularly since the early 20th century, also on world culture. The books on um, Ulysses and Odysseus in the African diaspora, the books on Caribbean treatments of the classics, including Homer. Um, Edith Hall, her book that I mentioned um, in the recommended books, her 2012 book, The Return of Ulysses, traces the influence of the Odyssey on a whole vast range of genres, such as poetry, the novel, travelogue, TV and film, including even pornography, drama, opera, detective stories, and science fiction. So there's a wealth of stuff. Um, where the Odyssey was an important influence. And of course, we can add other things um, to that, such as sculpture, things she doesn't deal with. She deals with mainly literary stuff. But sculpture, painting, graphic art, video games, I mean, the influence of the Odyssey is everywhere. So in my last two lectures, I can do nothing more than just skim the surface of this huge ocean of material. I would have loved to talk about the treatment of Ulysses, Odysseus, in Greek and Roman literature after Homer, but those of you who watch Trevor Noah's show, The Daily Show, know he's got a segment where there's just so much, and we ain't got time for that. Uh, no, unfortunately, I just don't have time to deal with all this material. Um, okay, we, in my introductory lecture, I, I had some illustrations from Greek art of Odyssean scenes, especially vase painting. Before we leave the ancient world, I'd just like to take a quick look at some Odyssey scenes in Roman wall painting from the last decades of the first century BC, so the end of the BC period. It's fascinating that the um, renowned Roman writer on architecture, Vitruvius, in his book on architecture, he listed, and I quote, the wanderings of Odysseus through varied landscapes, unquote, as a very suitable subject for domestic wall painting, for mural painting, such as the Romans loved, as we know from what we find at Pompeii and, and elsewhere. And no examples of this subject used in wall painting were known until 1848. In that year, by chance, earthworks uncovered part of an elegant Roman villa right in the middle of Rome itself on the Esquiline Hill. And the subject here was precisely this, the adventures of Odysseus um, amid landscapes. The scenes, the first few scenes I'll show you are Odysseus in the land of the Lestragonians, it's Odyssey Book 10. And you can see that the, the, in, a, in a way these are the first real landscape paintings among the first in Western art. I mean, the landscape dominates in the pictures, and the figures are a minor element. But what they are are the scenes from Odyssey 10. Here, Odysseus's men sent out by him to see where they've come to. This is the giant daughter of the uh, leader of the Lestragonians. This is a spring figure of a spring here. You can see the ships around the corner there. The Odyssey says, my men looked on this giant woman and loathed her. Uh, so that, that, that's the encounter there. She's got a jug in her hand coming down to draw water. But, uh, uh, yes, you're not seeing it. Uh, there we are. Uh, oh, is it not? Um, uh, OK, let me, let me do it like that, rather. OK, so in this, um, <laughs> there, well, there, there's the daughter there. There's the jug, and there are the figures. Um, the Lestragonians are summoned. They come and pull down branches from trees and um, rocks from the, I know what it is. He's changed the sort of setting on here, so uh, that's a bit of a pity. Well, should have got a pointer. Um, here, uh, this is a, a mythological representation of a spring, often shown as um, male or rivers as male figures, springs as female figures. Okay, so here the one's already carrying off one of Odysseus's men. Here you can see one grasping the prow of a ship. Um, and this is the leader Antiphates of the Lestragonians over there. But this kind of dominating, rocky, misty landscape. Here, 
here is a close-up of the scene where Odysseus's ships have all come inside this fjord-like harbor. Um, Odysseus's ship alone remains outside, and here the ships are being wrecked, and it's the end of Odysseus's fleet. From here on, he's reduced to only one ship, his own. Then one last in this series. This is Odysseus at the entrance to the underworld, book 11. Here's his ship over here. Again, sort of figures of divine figures in the landscape. And these indistinct figures here, they've all got labels on them telling you who they are. I interestingly, in Greek. So it must have been done by a Greek artist or been a copy by, uh, of a Greek painting. So there's Odysseus there with his companions behind him. Here are all the ghosts waiting to drink the blood so they get a voice. And here's the figure of the prophet Tiresias that Odysseus has come to consult. Okay. Um, we leap forward now out of antiquity a thousand years into the Middle Ages. Remember, as I said when I was talking about translation, this was a time when knowledge of Greek disappeared from the West. The cultural language was Latin. So everything that even very educated people in the Western Middle Ages, what they knew about Greek literature came to them mainly through Roman literature. So they knew quite a lot about the figures of Greek myth, about the Trojan War and so on, but all filtered through a Roman perspective. That's not too mixed a metaphor. <laughs> um, particularly important was Virgil's great national epic of Rome, the Aeneid, which, in which, of course, the Trojans are the ancestors of the Romans. So quite the reverse of the Greek tradition where the Achaeans or Greeks are the heroes of the Trojan War. For Virgil, the Greeks are the enemy, and the Trojans are the, the sympathetic figures. So obviously this leads to a reinterpretation of figures like Odysseus or Ulysses, as it would be for them. Oh, sorry, I meant to say, uh, those, those kind of paintings always remind me very much of Turner. Now there's the same kind of misty landscapes with, you know, landscape vastly dominating over the human figures. This is actually, a, you can see the subject, Ulysses deriding Polyphemus, the Cyclops. The Cyclops is almost like a part of the landscape up there. Oh, sorry, I must look at the screen. This giant, you can see his shoulder and his head there. And here's a Ulysses, Turner often liked a little bit of red in the middle of the picture to draw the uh, viewer's eye. There's Ulysses over there, hands raised, taunting um, the giant. This is very much Turner's subject matter, kind of the puniness of human beings and human achievement in the face of the incredible forces of nature. Okay, if we can make our leap again into the Middle Ages. Um, to Dante, um, of course, the Italian author of the greatest, most influential epic of the medieval period, La Divina Commedia. Um, it's a difficult poem to describe. I mean, it's philosophical, it's historical, it's religious, and it's autobiographical all at the same time. Of course, Dante is writing throughout from the perspective of a devout medieval Catholic. So he believes you know, totally in this concept of punishment or reward after death for what we've done in life, the inferno, um, hell where the Sinners are punished, purgatorio, where it's kind of waiting station if you're not quite ready for heaven, and paradiso, paradise for the virtues. <coughs> Here's a, a picture of, of Dante, the world as Dante saw it. So hell as the series of concentric narrowing circles. And it's a kind of moral geography for. Dante. You've got the mildest sinners against love um, um, near the top, 
Paolo and Francesca and people like that, and also virtuous pagans uh, who could, didn't really know better. And then the sins become worse and worse as we go down through these concentric circles to the very pit of hell <coughs> from where a winding tunnel leads to the mountain of purgatory on the other side of the world in this hemisphere of water. And this is relevant to this geography, to his Ulysses um, canto. As I've already mentioned at the beginning, um, throughout his journey through these places, well, th his, throughout his journey through Inferno and Paradiso, he has the most virtuous of the pagans, Virgil, his poetic master as his actual guide taking him down through these places. But yeah, uh, Dante has to bid farewell to him at, at the gates of Paradiso when his love, um, Beatrice, takes over. Okay, as they go down, in Cantus 26, Dante, guided by Virgil, encounters Ulysses linked with Diomedes down in the lowest parts of hell among the counselors of fraud. Well, why are they there? Um, before we look in detail at Dante's narrative, I'd just like to take a step back and look at where Dante got his conception of Ulysses from. Some of his notions about Ulysses. Okay, after Homer, in the so-called epic cycle, these are a series of myths about the bits that Homer doesn't narrate about the Trojan War. And in Greek tragedy, and in Virgil's Aeneid, where the Greeks are the enemy, these are all places where Ulysses, Odysseus, has a very negative image painted of him. I mean, why? Um, for a start, Odysseus tries, you know, as a kind of trickster figure, he tried to avoid entirely going to the Trojan War. But a um, mission including Palamedes came to Ithaca, Odysseus pretended to be mad, he was plowing the seashore and sowing salt. Palamedes saw through his trick and placed the infant Telemachus in front of the plow, and Odysseus obviously recognized what was going on, so he was forced to join the Trojan expedition. So he had a grudge against Palamedes. Um, he's linked often in this epic cycle and tragedy and so with Diomedes even in the Iliad to some extent. And again, in the epic cycle, Odysseus and Diomedes treacherously killed Palamedes by drowning him, very unheroic kind of action, and also very bad from the perspective of someone like Virgil. Odysseus and Diomedes together steal the Palladium. This is an image of the goddess Pallas Athene on which the fate of Troy depends. So these are all kind of strikes against him in this, the post-Homeric tradition. Okay, coming back to Dante and his Ulysses, this is a map, um, the bulges or, or um, troughs uh, which go down within each, within, um, each circle. Here we are down in Trough number eight, we get the counselors of fraud, where Odysseus uh, and, and Diomedes, Ulysses and Diomedes, confront or are confronted by Virgil and Dante. Now, Dante's knowledge of Ulysses comes purely through Latin sources, um, but his description of U Ulysses' famous last voyage, which becomes a permanent part of the kind of Odysseus Ulysses myth. That seems to be Dante's own incredibly inspired inven invention. So um, Dante asks Virgil, well, who, who are these twin flames? What is this? And Vir Virgil answers him. Tormented there, said he, Ulysses goes with Diomede, for as they ran one course sharing their wrath in things like the Palladium, killing Palamedes, shared their wrath, they share the avenging throes. So again, bearded Virgil, callow youth, uh, well, he's in the middle of his life, so about 40, um, Dante, and 
Ulysses and Diomedes. Rather amusingly, Virgil says, well, I'll do the talking here because they'll speak Greek and I, I know Greek and you won't, you won't understand them. So Virgil asks the questions. Then Ulysses answers and says, so he completely reinvents the myth. Um, Ulysses answers Dante and says, well, he never did go back home to Ithaca. So um, he never returned. And rather, he says, no tenderness for my son nor piety to my old father, Laertes, nor the wedded love that should have comforted Penelope. And what is his motive? Could conquer in me the restless itch to rove and rummage through the world, exploring it, all human worth and wickedness to prove. So um, Ulysses voyages on for years. He goes out of the Mediterranean, out of the known world beyond the pillars of Hercules, which mark the exit into the Atlantic. And then he seems to sail further and further and further south until they're in sight of a towering mountain. Now, of course, we, with, in retrospect, with Dante's help, know that this mountain is the mountain of purgatory. But of course, Ulysses, to him, it's just an unknown um, peak. Just to remind you, there's, there it is down there. So they've gone out of the Mediterranean and down, down, down to near this mountain. The most famous part of this canto is, of course, the speech that Ulysses now makes to his crew. Brothers, said I, that have come valiantly through 100,000 jeopardies undergone to reach the West, you will not now deny to this last little vigil left to run of feeling life, the new experience, that's the important thing, of the uninhabited world behind the sun. And famous lines, given to you in Italian if you like, he, sa he says, considerate la vostra semenza, fatti non foste viver come bruti, ma perseguir virtute conoscenza. I think of your breed, for brutish ignorance, your metal was not made, you were made men. And what does being a man mean? To follow, follow after knowledge and excellence. Very sort of pagan um, virtues. And then a, a whirlwind comes up out of this unknown land that they're in sight of, creates a whirlpool, and it swallows up Odysseus's crew and Odysseus's ship and all its crew. Okay, well, going back to them being among the counselors of fraud, why are they specifically here for Dante? Um, one can only kind of try to interpret. Presumably, it's for Odysseus's kind of abandonment of his family. He never returns to Penelope and Telemachus and to his, his old father. Um, I think also importantly, it's for the speech that I've just quoted. He's promising his crew knowledge and excellence, which of course for a medieval Catholic like Dante could only come through divine revelation. So it's a sort of false promise um, that Dante is making to his crew that in fact leads to their death. And also perhaps for his treacherous deceits against Troy, which uh, Dante taking Virgil's side would see as impious crimes. Well, just to conclude on Dante, um, so Dante interprets Odysseus Ulysses as a kind of embodiment of secular Western man with an insatiable lust for knowledge above all, above all else, uh, as a transgressor of established limits going beyond the known world out of the Mediterranean, and this leading inevitably to disaster. I mean, he's clearly the kind of um, figure very much like Faust, um, as represented by Goethe and Marlowe and, and others. It's kind of someone who sells their soul for knowledge. And Dante's version was ma hugely influential. Um, he's been described as a kind of centrifugal uh, Ulysses, whereas Homer's Odysseus is centripetal, seeking home, seeking the center. Dante uh, invents a new Ulysses that's fleeing outward, away from home. 
But whereas Dante sees Ulysses' voyage as fascinating and bold, but ultimately impious and doomed, later authors find him an admirable figure. They simply dispense with the medieval Catholic framework and kind of take him at face value as a great quester after, after knowledge and experience. Again, if I'd had time, I would have loved to look at in Primo Levi's um, Auschwitz mem memoir of This is a Man, there's a chapter called the Ulysses Canto, which uses um, Dante's Canto 26 as a kind of background to the world of the um, extermination camps. It's very powerful. I recommend it to you um, to read for yourselves. Okay. Moving on to Tennyson, you have his dates there, English romantic poet. Now, of course, for Tennyson, the sources for knowledge about Odysseus, Ulysses would have been much larger than for Dante. Um, Tennyson was an excellent classical scholar. You can see it everywhere in his, in his poetry. Well, not that I've read all his poetry, but what I have read, you can constantly see influences of uh, just in matters of rhythm and meter and language and phraseology and so on. So his knowledge of the Od Odysseus and his adventures would have been based directly on Homer's Odyssey. But he was well aware, obviously, of Dante's version as, as well. Like many Romantic poets, Tennyson's deeply concerned with emotions, questions of faith, reasons for living, life of action versus the life of contemplation. And his handling of Ulysses is very much conditioned by those sorts of concerns and preoccupations. His two famous poems that draw on Ulysses' Odysseus are The Lotus Eaters, composed in 1832 and revised for publication 18, 10 years later, 1842. And then, um, Ulysses, written 1833 and published 1842. A major event of, in Tennyson's life around the writing of both these poems was the death of his very close friend who was actually engaged to be married to Tennyson's sister, um, Arthur Hallam, who died, I think he was only 22, um, very early 20s, he, he died in 1833. And this was a severe jolt to Tennyson's faith. Hallam had been thought to be one of the most brilliant, one of the most promising men of his generation, and suddenly his life was cut short. Okay, if we can take a look first at the Lotus Eaters fairly briefly. This poem is, of course, based on a mere 20-line episode of Odyssey Book Nine, uh, where... As, as you said, Odysseus's men encounter the lotus eaters. They browse on this drug-like fruit doing nothing. People who eat it forget about everything else and just want to um, relax and eat the lotus. Tennyson's poem is much longer, expanded to 173 lines from this 20-line Odyssey episode. Poem consists of two parts. There's a 45-line third-person narrative introduction to the poem, um, where the poet tells how they, Odysseus is never named, it just says they came to a land. It's obviously the Odysseus and his crew that are meant from details of the poem. So Odysseus isn't named, but he's clearly intended. So they came to the land of the lotus eaters. And this is a dreamy, slumberous place, quote, a land in which it seemed always afternoon. And then the lotus eaters appear, and what follows for the rest of the poem is a 130-line choric song, a kind of choral song, which seems to be sung by the crew. Okay, so it's a poem sort of with a kind of double form to it. And it's from their, their song, this choral song, that we get the famous phrase, why should life or labor be, uh, they ask. Okay. So this is the description of the arrival there. 
a land where all things always seemed the same, and round about the keel with faces pale, dark faces pale against that rosy flame, the mild-eyed melancholy, I love that phrase, which reminds us of any sort of dacha smokers, the, the mild-eyed melancholy lotus eaters came. So they share their fruit. Then someone said, we will return no more. And all at once they sang, our island home. It's not named, but must be Ithaca. Our island home is far beyond the wave. We will no longer roam. Um, and then the concluding lines of the poem, surely, surely slumber is more sweet than toil, the shore than labor in the deep mid-ocean, wind and wave and oar. O oh, rest ye, brother mariners, we will not wander more. Um, as so often in the reception of the Odyssey through the centuries, what Tennyson does here is to make explicit symbolism that's just kind of latent under the surface in Homer. You know, Homer is not really an allegorical or symbolic poet, but so many of the episodes of the Odyssey lend themselves to allegorical or symbolic interpretation. So the whole poem is filled with this drowsy, languorous atmosphere. And the main contrast in the poem is between the life of action, doing, voyaging, represented by the sea and seafaring, constantly con uh, contrasted with the life of contemplation and inaction represented by the shore and the activities on shore. So that, that is the contrast to get at the end here, the shore more sweet than labor in the deep mid-ocean. Um, some details, however, in the song that we get in the Lotus Eater seems to undermine that life of inaction, particularly the indifference to the suffering of ordinary human beings, which they kind of know about, but they can feel they can do nothing about. OK, Ulysses. Um, in a way, or in, I think in several ways, Ulysses is a kind of answer to the Lotus Eaters. And it's another very important moment in the reception, the reworking of Ulysses Odysseus. And certainly it's definitive, I think, for 19th century Britain. Um, on page two of the handout, you've got the text of the poem there. The poem's a monologue delivered by Ulysses himself. It's got semi-dramatic form to it. Um, for example, at line 33, down the first column, the last paragraph beginning, this is my son. And the beginning of the next paragraph on the second column, there lies the port. So it's got the semi-dramatic form as if we are present in the, within the scene. Um, Ulysses speaks partly to himself, obviously overheard by the reader audience, and partly to the mariners who are named at line 45 in the poem. Now the poem obviously partly has an autobiographical aspect being written just after the death of Hallam, for whom Tennyson wrote his famous poem of mourning, In Memoriam. But Tennyson himself said later to a friend, and I quote, there is more about myself in Ulysses than in, in memoriam. Ulysses, which was written under the sense of loss and that all had gone by, but that still life must be fought out to the end. But clearly the figure of Ulysses here is more than just autobiographical gr grieving um, Tennyson. Poets of Ulysses is very much aware both of Homer and of Dante, but especially of Dante. From Homer, we get the um, prophecy of Tiresias in Book 11 in the Underworld, where Tiresias tells Odysseus he's going to have to voyage again soon after the suitors have died. Um, he'll have to undertake a, f a further voyage. And there are a number of other Homeric touches in the poem. But the conception of Ulysses here, as I've indicated, is deeply influenced by Dante. OK, the poem. Um, clearly, many years have gone by 
on Ithaca. So this is not like Tiresias' prophecy where Odysseus will leave soon after coming back or then, and will come back to Ithaca. Here, Ulysses is now old at line three. He says, matched with an aged wife. So he and Penelope are old. He says to his crew later on, you and I are old. And Ulysses is now restless. He's been in Ithaca long enough. As in, as in Homer, he's a warrior and a man of suffering. He talks about having suffered much, fought at Troy and so on. But in, more importantly, I think in this poem, Dan, like Dante's Ulysses, Tennyson's is especially a restless wanderer. Again, a centrifugal figure wanting to head out in search of new knowledge and experience. So we can look at those lines. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly. I am become a name for always roaming with a hungry heart. Much have I seen and known, cities of men and manners, climates, councils, governments. That's like the opening of the Odyssey and a wonderful image. All experience is an arch where through gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move, the horizon keeps shifting. And he talks about this gray spirit, again, indicating age, yearning in desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. It's a very Dante, Dantesque sentiment. And the central part of the poem concerns Ulysses' son, Telemachus. It's kind of am ambiguous, because on the one hand, it suggests that Telemachus is a dutiful, decent kind of figure, um, but perhaps rather unimaginative, lacking his father's questing, inquiring spirit. On the other hand, this could also suggest some criticism of Ulysses as abandoning his duties as leader on Ithaca to go out questing again and searching after knowledge and, knowledge and experience. The last section of Ulysses, uh, Tennyson's Ulysses, is by far the most famous part of the poem and the most like Dante. Like Dante's Canto 26, Tennyson's Ulysses ends with a rousing speech by the hero to his crew and also hints at a possibly disastrous conclusion. Come, my friends, it is not too late to seek a newer world, full of cliches. <laughs> There's obviously phrases which have become, like Shakespeare, famous from this poem. Push off, and sitting well in order, smite the sounding furrows. That's a purely Homeric formula, often repeated in the Odyssey. For my purpose holds, and now we get into sort of Dante, to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew, which people suggest as a kind of allusion to his friend Hallam. Um, and the poem ends with the famous line, to strive, to, to seek, to find, and not to yield. So clearly this is the kind of riposte in a way to the, the seductive tones of the lotus eaters. Okay, um, the last part of this lecture turned to visual art. Again, there's so much here. I've just narrowed it down to paintings inspired uh, by the Odyssey, just two female figures from the Odyssey, the witch goddess Circe and the sirens who present this danger through their seductive song to Odysseus and his crew. And again, we'll see how much these paintings are influenced by the cultural preoccupations and um, uh, concerns of the time. Here's uh, just a little bit from U Judith Yarnell's book, The Transformation, Transformations of Circe, the, um, the highlighted bits. The archetypal image of the dark, dangerous woman proliferated in 19th, the 19th century, particularly late 19th century literature and visual art. 
then skipping down to the bottom to give some examples there. For every chaste, subservient, and spiritually radiant angel of the house or household nun, that's a rather nice phrase, shadow figures of monstrous devil women existed in imagination, if not in reality. What Yarnell says here is perfectly exemplified by paintings of the Odyssey and Circe and of the sirens from this period. What's interesting in these pictures is that the females are dynamic, active, seductive. They completely take the initiative. And the men are these rather pathetic, passive victims. Um, the artworks clearly tell us more about the fears and fantasies of 19th century men than about actual women of the time. I'd just like to go back in time for the first slide just to give you some point of comparison. I mean, here's a woodcut from the 15th century. Um, and there's Circe, heavily, fully clothed. It's got a name there in Latin behind her, Kirkaya. And here are some of the people she's transformed into animals. Rather nice to have still got some clothes on so we can see they were once, they were once humans. They've got human legs too. So lions and wolves are mentioned in the Odyssey. And of course, the pigs into which she turns uh, uh, Ulysses' comrade. So here's Ulysses uh, with his name, Ulysses, there above him. OK, in a Renaissance painting, you've got the painter's name up there. Circe here, now topless, but still quite a demure figure. And she doesn't have the black and red hair. She's got blonde hair not the black-haired, red-haired seductress of 19th century art. And no swine in this picture, just these rather more noble animals. The lion, that has to be a wolf, and another lion there down under her feet. And also, this painter is interested in other aspects of the story. Um, here's Ulysses encountering the god Hermes. We can tell him by the wings on his cap and his staff. And Hermes is giving him the moly, the magic plant, that will protect him against Circe's magic. Right, well, let's have a look at some paintings. Here's one by a Belgian painter, Charles Hellmans, from 1881. Um, Circe. <laughs> so she's entirely modernized as this presumably courtesan. Notice all the red in the picture. I mean, the red background, red dress, red wine red flowers in her hair. She's fully clothed, but clearly the highlight on her breast and her thigh indicating, and the sort of dress pulled aside, indicating her seductive power. And here's the drunken swine that, she, <laughs> that she's turned into a, an animal in, in the background. They say entirely sort of passive figures, these poor male um, victims. Um, with his glass spilled in front of him. OK, another Circe from 1889 by a painter, Wright Barker. Um, this artist was best known for his paintings of people's livestock and pets, which would maybe explain why the animals are so, so beautifully rendered in the picture. Um, Again, Circe now bare-breasted, but quite a sort of innocent figure. She sort of looks almost like a sort of Parisian chorus girl um, coming out. This is the moment in Odyssey 10 where Odysseus's men hear her singing and working at the loom. She knows they're there, and she comes, comes rushing out to invite them in. And here's the warning. All these former visitors turned into wolves and, and lions and a sort of seductive and warning tiger skin uh, on, the, on the steps. No, no pigs in the picture because no one's been transformed into a pig. Sorry? Yes, she could. <laughs> another, another danger. Again, red in the picture in her hair and these red flowers scattered over the steps. OK, then a picture by Waterhouse, a minor pre-Raphaelite painter who liked classical subjects. We'll see several of his uh, pictures in the little time remaining to us. 
Um, here we've got a dark-haired, red-lipped, youthful Circe. It's both sorcerer. She's got a magic potion in the cup in her right hand, and seductress. See the transparent gown showing off her legs, her breasts, her one breast half bared here, and a very wary looking Odysseus um, reflected in the mirror behind her. And she brandishes her wand through rather like a heavy cane as if she's about to administer discipline of some sort. There's a huge rod in her hand. Um, quite a nice touch. Well, uh, interesting touch is that with her arms reflected in the mirror behind her, it looks like there's a multi-armed Indian goddess, so there's a kind of orientalizing aspect to this picture as well. Again, would represent danger, the exotic, the strange. Um, there are no animals in the picture except this one very drugged-looking pig um, at her feet over there, presumably one of Odysseus's men. So you can see similar kind of treatment. The most overtly erotic of all these Circes is this one um, by a certain Arthur Hacker, well named, I think, um, from 1893. So now Circe is completely naked from that heavily dressed figure of the, of the woodcut. We get to completely naked Circe striking this seductive pose. It's really a piece of late Victorian soft porn. Um, the only other creatures in the picture, this is presumably Odysseus staring his eyes out, um, and a companion there. And here's one half transformed, still got arms, raising them in the air. And all these kind of phallic objects in the picture, this spear thrusting into the picture on the right hand side. Um, over there in this rather fully looking big snout reaching towards her in the background. Um, and yet, I mean, it's pretty obvious to us what this is about, I think. Despite the strongly highlighted figure of this totally naked Circe being blatantly the focus of the painting, contemporary men were only to be too happy to be taken in by a hint of allegory. When the picture was exhibited in 1893, an approving male critic wrote that the painter, I quote, had sought to accentuate the degradation of bestiality and sensual depravity of the transformed victims of Circe. I think if you believe that, you'll believe anything. OK, finally, um, sirens. Now, Homer, uh, well, I'll come back to this in a minute. Homer actually has nothing to say about the appearance of the sirens in the Odyssey. Greek art represented them like harpies, that is, birds of prey, but with just women's heads, sometimes upper body of a woman. We saw, if you remember the Greek vase from the first lecture, there were some sirens there. One was clothed, one was bare-breasted, but both had woman at the top and then bird from the waist down. 19th century painters thoroughly eroticize these figures. And I think there's something of Tennyson's Ulysses in these paintings. We'll see in, in, in many of them there's a kind of contrast between the shore and the sirens female realm and the active, vigorous male realm of rowing across the ocean. Start with an early example from 1837 by an English painter, Etty. It's close to the Odyssey account. So you've got um, Odysseus being tied up here. It's a bit of bondage in these things as well, lots of ropes and tightening. Um, there's Odysseus being tied up by his men who can't hear the siren song. And here are the remains of people who've succumbed to the siren's lure, graphically sort of vivid representation of corpses in various stages of decomposition. Etty apparently actually visited the morgue to study uh, the way bodies rot for this picture. And then next to them, these naked, seductive female figures. But as in the Odyssey, they stay on their rocky shore and tempt them from a distance. Um, you can see their mouths are open, 
singing, and most painters add a lyre there. You can just see it, the stringed instrument, to indicate that there's music going on here, and singing. <coughs> um, and notice the sort of st dark, stormy background indicating the kind of danger and dramatic threat involved in the picture. I think the, I mean, the kind of concerns of this picture quite dramatically anticipate decadent and symbolist art of the end of the 19th century, where you get this constant, um, r constant association between f women, sexuality, and death, and people like Baudelaire love those kind of themes. Uh, there. I think it may just be damaged. This painting was heavily restored and it may be part of the restoration. Um, I don't know of any other significance. There may have just been a tear in the canvas. And okay, here's a French academic treatment of the subject by a French academic painter. You can see it's quite Poussin-like, the colouring uh, although the females are distinctly out of Rubens, I would, I would think well, very fleshy figures, um, normal, I should say. Um, it's close to the Odyssey account in that you've got Odysseus again tied to the mast and um, someone working on his ropes there in the background. These figures with, you know, it's hard to show visually wax in the ears. So, the painters tend to put sort of caps over their heads, blocking their ears to indicate that the sailors can't hear. But what's striking, of course, in this painting is that now the, s the sirens have swarmed off their shore and actually climbing over the ship. Again, you've, this time you've got uh, the lyre, the, the singing, the appeals. Um, so it's, again, this kind of passive Odysseus and these active um, females coming to, coming to get him. And again, you get these sort of phallic things in the pictures, very upright prow, and this thing in the, the, the prow, the prow of the ship, and the hand on the oar. The painters love that, uh, love that detail. Okay, just a couple more. This painting by Lord Leighton. I uh, went and visited his house when I was in London last year. He's got a wonderful oriental fantasy, <laughs> fantasy house. He loved classical subjects. This is clearly a sort of siren-like figure, but actually this picture is based on a poem by Goethe about a, a fisherman and a sea creature that comes out. You can see it's the most avert overtly erotic of all the pictures so far, this powerful embrace naked bodies pressed together. She's got a fishtail wound around his leg. Uh, and him in this utterly kind of passive, Christ-like pose with drooping head, um, able to do nothing about the seductress. Um, here's Waterhouse again with a red-headed um, siren, the Perlamun lyre, rather nice, or abalone shell. You see it also in another painting. Um, and this is not quite the Odyssey episode, but it's sort of what's happened before the Odyssey, a shipwrecked sailor. There's bits of his ship kind of drawn hypnotically to this siren-like figure. OK, last two. A painting from 1909 by H.J. Draper. And you, so you can kind of get used to the, the tropes of this kind of painting now. This is, to me, very like Tennyson. I mean, look at the stern resolve here. He's clinging to the oar, looking straight ahead. Uh, this one, kind of a little sideways glance, but sort of manly endeavor threatened by these seductive, swarming female figures. Again, the hand on the oar there. Um, the Pearl of Moon Lyre in the background. Uh, a little invention of this particular painter is that these figures seem to lose their fish-like appearance as they come out of the water. So this one has got a fish tail, this one's got sort of greenish legs, and then the, they become fully human as they, as they uh, arrive on the boat. And again, the billowing sail, the choppy seas, indicating the drama and danger 
of the situation. Okay, lastly, this is actually an earlier painting um, that I left it to last because it's a little bit different, again, by our friend Waterhouse. And what's interesting is that he's clearly someone who knows his Odyssey and his classics because he, doesn't repre he represents the sirens in their ancient form as birds with women's heads, very pre-Raphaelite heads, as you can see there and there and there. Um, so f flying around the ship, Odysseus tied to the mast. Again, notice he's got the conical cap of ancient art. So this, you know, an academic painter clearly knows his ancient representations of Odysseus and Odyssean subjects. And here again, the crew busily rowing their heads heavily covered to muffle their uh, ears. Only Odysseus's ears are clear. This one seems to be hearing something and trying not to. Uh, and again, you get these shields along the side of the ship, which uh, the painters the painters liked. Okay, I'll stop there. And as usual, if you have any, if you have any questions or queries, I'll be welcome, welcome to ask. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Tomorrow we'll look at, at Joyce. Yeah, well, the bit we look at isn't 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 too difficult. The bit we'll be looking at is not is pretty accessible. It's not like some of the other parts of Ulysses. Yeah, the texts we'll look at in most detail are. are I won't again have time for all of them, unfortunately. Uh, Ulysses. We'll look at a little bit at the uh, Margaret Atwood one. We'll look at Cavafy's uh, poem Ithaca. So you can do your, re your homework for tonight. Anyone else? Anything? Yes. I have actually. I've just started reading it. Uh, it's by Madeline Miller. It's mm. Yeah. And um, Rachel has called her backstory, which I think is very cool, and also her future after the Disney Yes, yeah, she, she was in Cape Town. Uh, yeah, um, she wrote a, a book about, what was it called? Uh, Achilles and Patroclus, um, based on the Iliad. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, no, and I've, yeah, I quite like the, I read the, Achilles and Patroclus one. I'll, I'll be interested to see uh, this one too. Okay, thank you.